Chrysalis A Story by User Beaverfur Chapter 5 Daukot's legs hurt. It was a deep, constant pain that increased with every movement, accompanied by a stiffness that slowly but surely had spread to envelop his whole body over the last days. In a way, he was surprised. He had always been taught that his species had evolved to jog up and down the expansive grass hills of his home planet, and that this was the reason Sanxians were so good at walking in uneven terrain. Well, apparently, someone forgot to tell that to Daukat's body. He had spent the last days a hostage of Yavit's Commissary of Agriculture, the effusive and surprisingly short Zunvirian informing him of everything there was to know and more about farming and planting on a colony world. They had visited irrigation projects, oxygenic tree plantations, mountain farms, ground decalcification facilities, river fish farms, red grass fields, ball tree farms, valley sweet thorn cultivation works, and all the other places whose names Daukot couldn't and didn't care to remember. If he didn't know better, he would have thought the commissary suspected the visit motives were a fabrication and was punishing him for it. But no, either the Zunvirian was a great actor or his intentions were honest, and Daukot leaned towards the latter. There simply was a certain mindset to people who willingly chose to move to a new world. A colony on the periphery of the Republic, which itself was on the periphery of the galaxy. To a world in development, without the comforts of civilization. Colonies attracted a certain kind of people. Honest, enthusiastic, and hard-working. A mindset that was increasingly rare among the inhabitants of the large metropolis where Daukat had spent most of his formative years. He walked up to his room's window and looked at Yovit's biggest and, to his opinion, only city. The town's location had been carefully chosen. It was built in a natural bay that gave its settlers access to the planet's single large ocean, but whose surrounding mountains protected it from the worst of the seasonal storms that periodically battered the continent. It was a mix-and-match of prefabricated boxy white houses, warehouses and workshops. Here and there, high-rise constructions of bare concrete and steel emerged from the sea of houses, such as the lodging he was staying at. He refused to dignify the place by referring to it as a hotel. The wide avenues, decorated with the local lush trees, only made the lack of actual motorized traffic even more apparent. While the main city enjoyed far more activity than the other towns Daukat had been recently visiting, it would be a far call to say it was bustling. In some sense, Daukat felt as if he had somehow traveled back in time, or was visiting some sort of pre-spacefaring civilization. The town, the whole colony, had an outdated air to it. The avenues would suddenly turn into dirt roads, forcing the ground vehicles to default to dangerous manual piloting, or sometimes he would come across a small house made entirely out of wood, of all things. It made for an odd contrast with the scattered displays of high technology he could glimpse at times. The recycling plants in particular were state-of-the-art even by council standards, and the spaceport, right across the street from the building he was at, featured an endless showcase of modern Zunvirian starships entering and leaving the planet's atmosphere. He could even see the embassy's ship, the white wedge-shaped vehicle with gold accents and elegant designs etched in its surface that Nakstani and him had used to get there. It was parked right at the edge of the enormous bare expanse of asphalt that was Yavit's only spaceport. He glanced across the bay toward the Colonial Directorate building, where his boss was at the moment. Always one step ahead, Nakstani had excused herself out of the agrarian excursion and decided to stay at the Directorate, visiting the local governors and high-ranking officers. The reasoning, she had explained to him in private, was that should the planet be attacked, its defense would be coordinated out of that building. Being there when that happened, she had said, would give them first-hand information on Zunvir's enemies. Daukat suspected her true reasons had more to do with aching legs and long-winded explanations on water processing techniques. He relaxed his eye membranes, letting them water his tired eyes, and slowly sat down in the room's only chair which creaked under his weight, the cursed thing. Letting out a breath, he activated his augmented irises and started going through the documents and the work he had been neglecting for the past days. He was reading a long-winded explanation of the Republic's proposed amendments to the export treaties, trying for the second time to unpack a particularly annoying sentence when a link to his boss opened. 
Hi, Dowcott, she said. Have any plans for this afternoon? Even when sub-vocalizing, Dowcott could pick up on a terse tone. Or maybe he was just imagining things. Yes, actually, I'm visiting an animal food reprocessing facility. Why don't you join me? I'm sure you'll enjoy it, he replied half-jokingly. Ah, maybe you should consider getting a sprained tendon or something. Stay here this afternoon. He paused. No, he hadn't imagined anything. Something was going on. Wait, is it happening now? As the only response he received a vid link, he opened it, a floating screen only he could see appearing in midair. It was a direct feed from her irises, showing him what she was seeing. Nakstani was at some sort of control room, standing next to a large screen along with a group of Zunvirian colonial officers. The screen showed a view of Yavit from orbit, the fleet of defensive military ships clearly visible, and a purple icon indicating... An incoming warp tunnel? Daokat muttered. Yes, time to collapse is three hours. It could be a civilian vessel, but... No flight plan? He ventured, reading the screen. All civilian ships were supposed to relay their warp jump plans to the authorities ahead of time. No. Should I join you there? He said at last. No, you're one street away from the spaceport as it is. If we have to evacuate, go to our ship and wait for me there. He nodded then muttered an affirmative when he realized she couldn't see him. Keep this vid link opened, though, she added. They went back to a tense silence, watching the countdown timer. Meanwhile, Daokot composed a short message to the Commissary of Agriculture excusing himself out of the afternoon's activities, a sprained tendon. Sometime later, he watched through Nakstani's feed as a group of military officers entered the control room and started evicting all the civilians. They tried to kick her out of the room, too but she very calmly declared that she had direct authorization from the Emperor himself to oversee any military operations. Daokat snorted, but the Zunvirians appeared to buy the bluff and let her stay. Or maybe they just had more urgent stuff to worry about. On the screen, the timer was down to one hour. Daokat opened the large cabinet in his room and took a small travel bag. He placed in it the synthetic food bars and medical supplies that he always traveled with in case of an emergency. Then, he added some extra clothing items and the energy handgun all Council Embassy members were issued with, just in case. Half an hour. The Zunvirian fleet had adopted a strange and very sparse formation in front of the warp tunnel's estimated exit point. Daokat absentmindedly looked up at the sky from his window, but of course he couldn't see anything, just a blue sky with some puffy white clouds. On the avenue outside, the sparse traffic flowed as usual, Daokat almost expected sirens to have gone off by now, but it seemed the Zunvirians were either confident they would come ahead, or they were still playing their cards close to their chests. He wondered if his and Nakstani's presence in the colony had anything to do with that. It's not like there were many places for the locals to take refuge in, though. Their best option would be running out of the city and into the farmlands and mountains surrounding it. Evacuating the planet, as always, was out of the question. In the history of the Council, many military leaders had proposed plans for evacuating worlds in case of an attack. But invariably they tended to be infeasible. Planets with large populations were simply impossible to evacuate in time, even when dedicating entire transport fleets to the task. And colonies like Yavit had most of their population dispersed across the land, in places where transportation was spotty and there was no easy access to a spaceport. And even if there had been a way to evacuate the civilians, they'd be put in orbit, right in the middle of the upcoming space battle, right where they could be easily captured or mistaken for combat vessels. No. The best recommendation in case of a planetary assault was to hunker down and weather the worst of it. Civilians were usually respected, and eventually wars ended. Treaties were signed and a solution was reached for the local populations. If the Terrans won here... They'd take over the colony and set their own interim government that could last months. It would give Nakstani and him the opportunity to talk formally with the newly discovered species, while also overseeing the Zunvirian population wasn't mistreated. But it wouldn't hurt to be prepared in case they had to hunker down themselves, he thought, eyeing the travel bag. Or if Nakstani decided it would be better to leave the planet altogether and take their chances up in orbit. Soon after the counter had reached twenty minutes, 
The screen shifted from the orbital view to a detailed, zoomed-in visual of the projected exit point. Ten minutes. Even through the feed, Dalcott could feel how tense Nakstani was. No joking, this time. Five minutes. Dalcott closed his travel bag and placed it in the center of the room, sitting back in the chair. He glanced at the cabinet and the expensive outfits he would be leaving behind, but quickly focused back on the vidlink. One minute. Nakstani let out a breath. Dalcott realized he was holding one of his own. Thirty seconds. This was it. He watched as the countdown timer went through the last numbers. Five. His eye membranes contracted almost on their own as if to protect the delicate eyeballs. Three. Two. One. Zero. The instant seemed to stretch, lasting forever, as if they were caught inside some sort of time dilation effect. And for a single, hopeful moment, Dalcott was sure that the timer would update again to simply show plus one, the Terrans having missed their appointment, and then the time would return to its normal speed and he would relax, and Nakstani would make some joke at the... The image on the screen changed. The first thought was one of incomprehension. Dalcott had expected an enemy fleet to pour out of warp, with battleships and escorting cruisers and formations and all that. But that wasn't what had happened. No, clearly there was something out there, but he couldn't make sense of the image. Then the view zoomed out, putting the image in context. And he understood. It was impossible, of course. They would have known. The Galactic Council would have known. Were there a civilization in the Orion Arm capable of building such a thing? The amount of resources involved, the amount of time, of energy to put that monster into space. And yet, there it was. A starship the size of a city. As if in defiance of the laws of physics and economics. Many expletives crossed his mind, competing for attention. But somehow he couldn't opt for just one of them. There wasn't a word to reflect the astonishment, the complete impossibility of the scene. So he remained silent. Nakstani, of course, didn't have such problems. Just who did these cursed mulch-smoking bastards pick a fight with? She was muttering. He was still trying to process the implications when the image changed again. New ships joining the oversized monster. It now looked closer to what Daokat had originally expected, a flagship with its escorting vessels. Except that each of the smaller vehicles were large enough to qualify as flagships on their own, larger than any capital ship in any of the fleets of the nations that formed the Galactic Council. Odds were, he realized, that he was looking at the nine biggest starships in the entire galaxy. Ah, he said to no one. And then, just as Dowcott thought he couldn't be more surprised, the screen started filling in hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of icons as new contacts appeared, entire waves of smaller vehicles coming out of the larger ships. There were so many of them the sensors couldn't keep pace. The red icons moved and danced around the massive vessels as if they were schools of fish around a giant sea creature, like a a swarm. There wasn't any better word to describe it. He absent-mindedly noticed he was back to a standing position, having left the chair at some point during the last moments, but he paid it no attention. On the screen, the Terrans were beginning their attack, moving as a large group towards one of the defending battleships, apparently chosen at random. Are the Zunvirians trying to contact them? Daukot asked. Yes, his boss replied. I got them to add our own message too, but no response so far. Dalcott felt a strange anger at the developing situation. It almost seemed obscene to use such a display of force to make such an overwhelmingly powerful attack against such a small colony world. As if the Terrans had no sense of proportion whatsoever. The reasoning for the Zunvirians' weird formation became quickly apparent as the rest of their warships moved towards the flanks of the enemy encircling the swarm and opening fire on it with all their energy weapons at the same time. 
dozens of beams crisscrossing the intervening empty space. The screen struggled to reflect the amount of Terran casualties, the hundreds of ships that they were losing under the hell of combined laser fire the Zenvirians were unleashing upon them. It appeared the smaller Terran craft weren't protected by any kind of shields, but still the blob didn't seem to thin, stoically enduring the assault without ever slowing its advance. With a shiver, Dowcott wondered if each of those small crafts was carrying a pilot. If so, retaining such level of discipline under the conditions they were being subjected to would speak volumes about the Terran mindset. Would they use some sort of brainwashing? Conditioned training? Drugs? Were they some society built on honor and total obedience? On a complete negation of the individual needs for the good of the collective? Somehow, he doubted they would be piloted. It was easier to refuse the idea that any sentient being would allow being subjected to that. But his memory reminded him that the swarm's target, the Zunvirian battleship that they had singled out by the Terrans, had submitted itself to its role as bait, was definitely piloted by a crew. He muttered a curse. Daokat had always known there was something strangely horrifying about war, some kind of rational madness to it. But seeing it play out in front of him was quite a different beast than learning about it from the safety of a philosophical essay. He saw as the Terran crafts finally reached their objective and began to slowly envelop the doomed battleship. And then things started happening very fast. A white flash on the screen marked the disappearance of the targeted ship, along with a small chunk of the enemy swarm. A few instants later, seven more flashes followed, each at the position of a close Zunvirian vessel. Nakstani pronounced the words, nuclear weapons. Daukat's mind raced to consider the diplomatic consequences of detonating thermonuclear ordnance in the orbit of an inhabited green world. In direct contravention of the most fundamental war treaties of the Galactic Federal Council. But he abandoned that train of thought as he saw the eight massive Terran escorting ships do something impossible. All of a sudden, they shot out of the main blob at an astonishing speed. Their acceleration so disproportionately high, he wasn't sure how the ship's structures could even handle such extreme forces, let alone how whatever crew was manning them hadn't just been instantly turned into paste. Each of them was aiming towards one of the main Zinvirian battleships, the ones that had stood out of range of the swarm during the entire battle, the ones that housed the fleet admirals and tactical command centers. The Terran ships had crossed most of the empty space separating them from the battleships in just a couple of seconds. But they didn't stop. They just kept accelerating, homing in on their targets. One instant too late, Dalcott realized they didn't intend to stop. The Terrans were using their own ships as oversized battering rams, as missiles. In his mind, that cinched it. The Terrans were lunatics, a berserk species that lacked any moral consideration towards the lives of you and their own crews. The Zinvirian battleships had too been caught by surprise at the strange maneuver. They fired their thrusters, desperately trying to get out of the way, but they just couldn't match the maddening levels of acceleration of their Terran counterparts. A moment later, Daukot stared in disbelief as the information representing the targeted vessels simply vanished from the screen. Nakstani's terse voice interrupted the feed. Daukot. She said, not bothering to subvocalize. We are evacuating. Go to the spaceport, get into our ship, and come pick me up here. As if on cue, the rest of the Terran swarm exploded, small dots flying everywhere, towards each and every one of the remaining Zunvirian ships, even towards the planet itself, Daukat noted, as he reached for his travel bag and left the room, his heart beating fast. The Zunvirian's careful formation was in shambles. Amazingly, half of the Terran giant escort ships had survived their respective impacts and were coming in for a second pass. The defending fleet was disorganized, some ships turning to respond to this new menace, others trying to contain the rising tide of the swarm. A series of white flashes followed, and more signal icons simply disappeared. Nakstani's vidlink started freezing and losing visual coherence, interferences continuously blocking the image and sound now. Right, Daokat thought. All those nuclear explosions must have been bathing the planet in a storm of electromagnetic pulses, and their communicators just weren't designed to operate under such conditions. Scampering down the stairs, he closed the video feed to save bandwidth, 
keeping the audio link still opened. He looked back at the sky as soon as he exited the building. A mesmerizing green and red aurora covered the whole horizon north to south. It was slowly spreading, dancing lazily far above the clouds. Dalcott ran towards the adjacent spaceport, dodging the locals who stood motionless all over the street looking at the sky. He didn't fault them, though. The sight was beautiful, in a horrifying kind of way. He heard the sudden voice of his boss. Dowcott! she all but screamed. We got to... and... Repeat that, he said. The link is cutting. Said... warn... you... ship! Dowcott again eyed the sky, now turning purple. What had she said? Something about the ship. He was now running past the large landing gear of the giant commercial freighters parked all over the place. His legs burned with the overexertion, each step sending pain through his whole body. Yes, I'm almost at the ship, he screamed back into the communicator. He could see his target, the embassy ship. He rushed towards its boarding ramp, from where one of the support staff was signaling him to move faster. Nakstani had probably contacted them, too, because the vehicle's engines were already turned on, filling the air with their piercing noise, raising a cloud of dust and wind that tugged at Daokat's clothes and buffeted his exposed silvery skin. Nakstani! he said as he climbed the ramp and entered the vehicle. We should try contacting the Terrans using the ship's quantum relay. Maybe we can still negotiate a truce, or stop them from shooting us down once we get up there. I don't... Listen! You need to warn the Council! A Type G Emer... It's an exp... Had she just said Type G Emergency? Dowcott moved towards the front of the ship, his steps muffled by the carpeted floors. He had to use his hands to grasp at the door handles and walls to keep his balance, as the spaceship was already starting its ascent. It's a what? he asked. An ex aider The link died. He was still trying to decipher Nakstani's words when he reached the ship's narrow cockpit. He all but climbed into the free seat next to the only pilot, a young female defanyard whose attention was currently focused on manually operating the vehicle. Her short brown coat of fur puffed up. Somehow, Daokat doubted this takeoff was following proper procedures. Nakstani had said to warn the Council. A Type G emergency. Type G. An event with the potential to cause grave loss of life and property across the entirety of the Galactic Federal Council and its associated states. Type Gs were an almost theoretical concept. Only one had ever been formally declared in the history of the Galactic Council, when an artificially engineered virus had spread across seven stellar systems, menacing to kill hundreds of millions. Declaring one here seemed excessive, even after witnessing the Terran's actions. So, what else had Nakstani seen? Daokat engaged the ship's quantum relay from his console and started inputting his identification code. He glanced out of the cockpit's window as he waited for the link to establish. The ship was now skimming the roofs of the city's houses, moving towards the monolith of the directorate building. He saw locals and virians in the streets turning to run towards nearby houses. Had the colonial authorities sounded the alarm? A few stopped to look at the passing vehicle, moving out of the way of the little tornado its engines were creating. The consul pinged, waiting for him to talk. This is Assistant Ambassador Daokat, he said. Code 376 Sphere speaking on behalf of Ambassador Nakstani, Code 939 Sphere. I'm declaring a Type G emergency originating at the Zunvir Republic Yavit system. He didn't miss the bewildered glance the pilot gave him. The consul pinged again. The message had been parsed by the automatic receiver. The link was redirecting. Up above, there were dozens of white trail lines slowly crisscrossing the sky. There was something. Something else Nakstani had seen. What had she tried to say? An expa... An ex... An expa what? And just then, he remembered something. Terran. That was what the Corvette captain had said back at the Empyrean Palace. Terran. Not Terrans. One. Singular. The Terran. A voice came out of the console. This is Permanent Security Dispatch speaking to Assistant Ambassador Daokat. Please confirm declaration of Type G emergency. Type G emergency confirmed, 
he replied, concise and to the point. Always be concise when speaking to dispatch, Nakstani had once told him. Describe it. The Zunvir Republic has been attacked by an exponential replicator, codenamed Terran. Replicator appears to be intelligent and of artificial nature and does not respond to communication attempts. Replicator is already in control of three, correction, four stellar sit- Light. A deafening noise. A roaring shadow darkening it all. A fleeting moment of surprise as left became down and right became up. Rolling. Crashing. A searing flash of pain crossing his mind. Darkness. Ooh, boy. Ooh, I love Chrysalis. Man. Oh, sorry. I'm streaming, by the way, guys. If you didn't see this one, I hope you uh, go check out the stream. Recording streams are fun. I talk to the chat. We get to, you know, dick around. It's fun. But thank you so much for being here, guys. I really do appreciate you. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe. Patreon link should be popping up here in just a second. And come join us on the Discord. We got lots of stuff going on over there. Um, I mean, by lots of stuff, I mean lots of people post lots of things about lots of stuff. Like food, movies, death worlders, philosophy, <laughs> the nature of reality. But uh, anyway, guys, uh, I will talk to you all later. I hope you have a fantastic day. I love you very much. Good night, y'all. Wait, no. Goodbye, y'all. Not good night. It's only 8.47. Bye! Wait, why am I going to get angry, Gregor? Gregor, why am I angry? No, I don't think I've ever I don't think I've ever been mad on stream. But why why am I gonna get angry? Angry Zren is approaching.